All right. Welcome to Maranatha Baptist Church, our Sunday school this morning. Uh, Tim was wondering if there was a teacher because I kept running around doing stuff. So I finally got in here. <clears throat> so we're going to do prayer requests, but I, I kind of want to just keep it short and concise because I want to get through the lesson. Last week it really rushed me through trying to get through the lesson last week. So if y'all can do your prayer request to the point, and uh, it'll help me out. And I'm trying to listen to you too, so keep that in mind as well. Okay, anybody? Anybody got a prayer request? I don't mean to scare you. I'm just saying, I just want to. Yes? Oh, Bobby Mann's pout fell. Oh, yeah. And your cousin has surgery on the 24th? Brain tumor. February the 24th, okay. Anybody in the middle? We got some distinguished guests with us this morning. <laughs> Steve and his wife, Anita, <laughs> decided to come up here. Anybody else on this side? I think I scared y'all, didn't I? I didn't mean to. Because I'm saying last week, I mean, it took, you know, it was almost after 10 before I even got started, and then I'm having to zip through the lesson real quick. But uh, I hate to say that, but we'll have to work it out so we can get it all done together somehow. Anybody else have a prayer request? Okay. Let's go, Lord, and pray, and we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, dear Lord, thank you for taking care of us. Thank you, Lord, we are able to come into your house um, we just never can say thank you enough for everything that you do for us and all that you have done for us. And we just thank you, Lord, for saving our souls and for being so kind and gracious to us all the time. And dear Lord, help us this morning, Lord, in, 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 our, in our church, in our services, Sunday school classes and children's ministries and in the preaching service this morning. Lord, help Pastor know what to say this morning. And lay the words on his heart and help him, Lord, as he preaches. And uh, help us to listen, Lord, to hear your words and apply it to our hearts and lives. Dear Father, we ask for you help Teresa's cousin about this upcoming surgery. Uh, help her through this, Lord, if you would, please. And we ask for Bobby Manspile that you take care of her. And Lord, we got a, a, you know, a lot in our church are not able to be here. Lord, you know that. And uh, for health reasons and unable to get out. And we ask you to help them and encourage them. And help us as a church to be sensitive on how to be an encouragement to them as well that you'd bless them, Lord. Uh, dear Father, we ask you to help us to be sensitive to souls that are around us, Lord, people that are lost that need to be saved, and how to be a witness to people and how to share the gospel with them. Dear Heavenly Father, help this morning in how to present this lesson. Lord, not just presenting information, not that, but just to come and worship you, Lord, to, to focus on you, Lord Jesus Christ, for coming into the world, um, that you would be honored and glorified everything that's said and done this morning. Uh, we ask you to help our families take care of them and those who might be visiting today because usually on Christmas it seems like people want to visit. We ask you to speak to their hearts, Lord. Help our pastor know what to say and those who are working with the children's ministry back there this morning as well. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. All right, this is a series of lessons I just put together about Christmas time. We did lesson one last week. Anybody remember what it was? Who was it about? Anybody, except for our guests, I mean, I'm sure they didn't know. Anybody who doesn't, who's here, happened to be here last week. I know it's been over 24 hours. I understand that. I'm trying to remember something. Anybody have any idea who we talked about last week? Oh, I didn't do a good job. I can see that now. Nobody knows. We talked about John the Baptist last week, about the birth of John the Baptist, his coming into the world. We talked about the times, the turbulent times of that when John came into the world. All this... And as you see the passage here, I'm using this title, The Fullness of Time, talking about when Jesus Christ comes into the world. This morning we're going to talk about the birth of Jesus, of course. Uh, Lord willing, next week we're going to talk about Anna and Simeon next week. And the following week we're going to talk about the kings, or the wise men, or the magi, however you want to call it. We always say the, wise, the, the three kings, but we'll talk about the magi, the wise men. It'll be the fourth lesson. So that's my plan, what we're doing. So anybody, now I can't ask you the question, if you don't know... What we talked about last week, we talked about turbulent times when, when, when John was, came into the world, 
Uh, we'll talk about, I'll show you a little bit of overview I've got here from last week, the slide from last week to help you out a little bit. Okay. So for this morning, if you want to, you'll be turning to Matthew chapter 1 and also Luke chapter 2 this morning. So we'll be in both places here. So here is our, the gift from God, the birth of Jesus. And this is the passages we'll be covering this morning. Um, in Matthew 1.21, the angel spoke and said, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Galatians 4, this is where I get the reference, 4, chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. The focus is this whole thing about trying to point out that in this one point in time that God laid out time for us. You know, time doesn't affect God, but he laid out time for us. And at one point in time, the world, everything came into place for John to be born, Jesus to come into the world, all these things that one point in time came together and how the Lord brought this together here. So here is the chart that I showed you last week. And I have copies of this chart up here for you. I told you I'd print them out. And that's another thing. I've got lesson one charts laid out. I've got lesson two with charts laid out. Also with lesson two, we've got prophecies, a list of prophecies here also about the Lord. Um, I also have resources. There's two kinds of resources here I talked about last week. And don't get excited. There's a Christmas song quiz at the end here if you want that. There's a copy of that here as well. So we get done with class after class. Don't come up here now and start grabbing the quiz. Start on the quiz now. But those things are laid up here for you after, this, after we get done with Sunday school. But this is the chart, if you can see it well enough, where it's about 6 B.C. Everybody, you know, I'm not worried about the exact time. And everybody's just, you know, was Jesus born in 4 B.C., 5 B.C. I'm using 5 B.C., so just bear with me on that. Where everything I'm doing is based off of that point in time. So here is talking about John. That's what we showed last week about where the angel appears to Zacharias in the temple. Anybody know what happened when Zacharias and the angel met? Zacharias did not believe the angel. And the angel told him what? And why is that? Why would he not believe an angel that comes and tells you this? And both of them were up in age, yes. You know, it was like, they were both up in age when he was told this. So with his unbelief, what happened? His questioning that, you know, hey, this can't happen. What happened to Zacharias? Pardon? He couldn't speak. He couldn't speak until John is born, until John is, is, is named, of course. So here's the last the, uh, storyline. Here is Elizabeth. Of course, Elizabeth concedes right after that. After Zacharias performs his priestly duties and they go back home, she concedes. But she hides for five months. She chooses to hide for five months. That's what she does. So at about the sixth month, the angel Gabriel comes and talks to Mary and reveals to Mary that she is going to have a child, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, telling her. So okay. So after that, Mary goes, and he is also, the angel also tells her something else. What's he tell her? She's going to have a child, but he also tells her something else. Her cousin is going to have a baby also. So with that, she goes and sees Elizabeth in Hebron, and she goes up to Hebron where, the, where she lives at to see Elizabeth there, and spends almost three months there, it says in the scriptures. She spends that time with her. So keep that in mind. Here is Elizabeth who had been pregnant for you know, almost six months, and now here comes uh, Mary to spend almost three months with her. So she's close to the end of her time to have John, of course. So what does Mary do? Mary leaves and goes back to Nazareth. So that's what this shows here. Oh, show it. She goes back to Nazareth. I didn't show him up. So she goes back to Nazareth. So shortly after that, John is born. And then what happens to him? The ritual they do all the time for these little guys. Circumcision. He had to go through that. So after eight days, he's circumcised. And once he's circumcised, his name is given. And they're trying to decide on his name. And, John, and Zachariah says his name's going to be John. Of course, and then after Zechariah says that, Zechariah's speech comes back to him. He prophesies about John in his ministry. Okay? And of course, we're going to talk about the birth of Jesus here in a moment. 
So that's kind of what we went over quickly, what we touched on last week. I'll know there's passages there for you. So now the background about the prophecies of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's some, here's, I got this slide and the next slide talking about a few backgrounds about his prophecy about our Lord. Um, how many prophecies involve our Lord? I'd read there's over 360 some prophecies that deal with his first coming. I don't know exactly what the number is. I've tried to look at different areas, and every author you read's got, you know, they come up with a different number. So that's a lot of prophecies about one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? To think about that, all these prophecies coming true about our Lord, about him, but they do come true. All these prophecies come about, about his first coming. Of course, we know eventually he's going to come again, the second coming, eventually. But here, talking about his first coming here, here's a few of those prophecies. One of them is here's the, the one from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Very familiar with a lot of us have heard this before. Um, but I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise her head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, what was this in regard to? What was this about when this prophecy was given? Anybody remember? What had happened? Pardon? Right. And humanity went into, Adam ate the apple, you know, apple, we don't know if it's an apple, but whatever they ate. They ate the fruit they wouldn't, shouldn't have eaten. And of course, all man is, is put into, uh, because of Adam as well, are put into, under sin. And of course, the Lord gives this promise here. The promise is about the Lord Jesus Christ coming and that what he is going to do, the enmity, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And who is he talking to when the Lord says this? He's talking to Satan. So I'm putting enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise her, thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And also now the next um, prophecy here is about the, I'm sorry, good, is the, uh, his, her, uh, her, his uh, birthplace. is in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Now we're going to see this in Matthew here in a few moments. But just to give you a background, here it is in Math, uh, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This passage here, but thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall, come, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose going forth hath been from old, from everlasting. Here's another two other prophecies. Talked about him, the virgin birth. Very familiar, we're so familiar with this a lot of times. But it says, therefore, Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. At the point when this, this prophecy was given, anybody know what happened when this prophecy was given? It was a dire situation for Israel. They, they thought they were going to be conquered and completely wiped out. But God said, this is going to take place. And it did take place years later. They thought they were going to be totally obliterated. But God promised that it did take place. His person and character, of course, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This just touches on some of those prophecies, I know. Just a few of them. I could not... So what I've got up here for you, if you want a copy, it's a list of prophecies about our Lord Jesus Christ, about his birth, and just his life as well. I've got copies of that up here for you. If I'm going too fast, wave at me and slow me down. I'll slow down for you a little bit, but I will slow down. The next one here is the genealogies about our Lord. So here's where you want to be in Matthew and you want to be in Luke to look at these if you want to see this. There's a physical descent, and there's the royal legal descent that you'll see here. So if you're familiar with Matthew, Matthew has the royal, the legal descent. He starts with Abraham. Well, he starts with Jesus. And he works, you know, if you see, he starts with Abraham, works his way down, about down to Joseph there. I don't know if you're familiar with that, if you've seen these two, uh, two lineages together here. So Luke does the physical descent, starting from where? With Adam. He starts the list out. Well, he really starts with Jesus and works his way back. When you read it, it goes back to Adam's what it does. So it's going back to that way. 
So there's these two genealogies here about our Lord to show up. Of course, you have David. And David was what? He was a king. And David had some sons. He had a son named Nathan. And this is a short, as you see, it's going to be really short here, from here to here to Mary to Jesus, of course. The physical descent. Right? The other side of David, he had, another, he had some other sons. He had another son that's famous. Anybody know? Who the other son is? Became a king? Solomon. So Solomon became the king. And of course, going down the list here, Joseph's father is Jacob. And these, Nathan and Solomon were brothers. So that's how far back in the generations it goes for you. See there. So on that side, on the, on the, on the physical side, he has Mary. But he's, not, he's born of a woman, right? But he's not born of David. I mean, he's not born of uh, Joseph as such, you know, of the lineage. Of, but just by this lineage here. Okay? Do have any questions about this? Now, if you read these passages here, I didn't print one of those out here for you, but you can see the whole list. It goes down, and then when it gets to David, then it splits off again into Nathan and Solomon. There's two lists there for you. Okay? So now let's get to the birth of Jesus. Now, I have here where Mary returns back to Nazareth from visiting Elizabeth. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 1 and verse... Well, good, no, I need Luke. Well, I meant to show. That's not where it's at. We'll go, to, we'll go to here. Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, it talks about, uh, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a, a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he stalled on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins." Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the, uh, the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Remember, that comes from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 is where that comes from. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son unto him, his son, and he called his name Jesus. The emphasis here in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through, uh, let's, I've got my slide here, 1 through 8, through these passages here, is about the virgin birth. There's seven of these emphasis here. I didn't come up with this list, but I thought it was a good list to share with you if you had never seen this. I've read, as you read through them, you say, oh yeah, I see that now. And you see them as you go through. But it's interesting that Matthew deals with these and presents these uh, emphasis on the virgin birth. What did you see? In, if, you lead, if you were to read Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, let's just touch on a few of those, and you'll see it here in a second. The first one says, verse 1, the, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac begat Jacob. So you're going to see this word begat taking place in here. And as it goes through, it goes begat all the way down through here until it gets to a certain point. Do you know where? Look down through there and look all the way down. The point is here, the word begat is used throughout the genealogy from one verses 11, all the way down through 17, except for the verse 16, where the term of whom is used of Christ's birth. Of whom is feminine in the Greek, indicating that Christ came of Mary, not of Joseph, thus referring to the virgin birth. That makes sense? That word of whom is a feminine word, not the begat word being used. 
The next one is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 here. Before they came together. The other one is Matthew 18, says, uh, 118 says, and she was, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Get them all to show up here. Uh, get them all to show up. Yeah. Uh, last one. She was found a child of the Holy Ghost. And ver- the next one is that, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 120. She shall bring forth a son. The word, see where it says it will bring, he will, she will bring forth a son. Matthew chapter 121. Contrast the statement of Zacharias and where it says in Luke chapter 113 says pertaining to John says she shall bear thee a son. <clears throat> a virgin shall conceive in Matthew 123 and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. I'm just trying to point out the emphasis here about the virgin birth we see in Matthew here in all of this. Okay? I might get done faster than I thought. I scared y'all in about prayer requests. I didn't mean to. I sure did. I just know last week I just rushed through this whole thing so much. So back to, our, back to this part here. I already read to you Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. But let's look back. Oh, I meant to show. It didn't show up. Go ahead. Well, let's look back at Luke for a second. I want to go back. I thought I had written it down here. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It didn't show up here. This is backing it up a little bit when Mary was told by, by the angel Gabriel about her to have a child. Okay, I meant to read that earlier. And in the sixth month, of the, of, in the, sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent, a, sent from God into a city of uh, Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angels came in unto her and said, Hail thou that are highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be, he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And then said Mary unto the angel, How, how should this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. And there, the, therefore also that, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, the woman... Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age and is in the sixth month of her, with her, who is called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Did you notice something there when the angel told her that? When he said about Elizabeth? What did he say about Elizabeth, about her situation? Yeah, but there's yeah that and nobody else catch on to that. What she said there, verse thirty-seven. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. You think about if, if Mary had thought about her cousin Elizabeth here and being up in age, knew how old she was. She was up in age, barren. I mean, she was known to be, and yet the angels tell her she's going to have a child, and the angels pointing out to her. Nothing is impossible with God. And how is Mary's reaction to all of this? It's different than Zacharias, isn't it? Remember John the Baptist's dad? It's different than him. And how is it different with Mary? I asked too many questions. <laughs> yes, go ahead, go ahead, Mary. She did. She was very accepting of that. You know, it was. 
So the angel appeared to Joseph, and we already read that part about appearing to Joseph here. So he's born. So go back to Luke, if you would, please. So hopefully you're in Luke there, and Luke over in verse chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And the taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. You think about this. Uh, remember, I don't know if you remember, I don't have the chart here to show you that, but it's in that handout there. I showed last the other week about the turbulent times, about Caesar, uh, Caesar Augustus here. When he took over, he took over the whole world at that time. Remember, there's, a, there's, a, there's the, that triumph, whatever you call it, it's a triumph bet, where there was three of them together working together as rulers of the world. But when he took over, finally took over, and he had full control of everything, then he institutes this uh, taxing of the world. How God moved everything in place for this to take place, for this guy Caesar Augustus. You know, his name wasn't Caesar Augustus to start out. It was Octavian. And he was appointed by his uh, uncle in the will to be the successor of his uncle who died. But how God just moved all this together for this one guy to control the whole world and to institute a taxing of the world versus having three guys who were in charge. Remember, I told that to you last week. There was three guys who were in charge at the time and how that could have been kind of divisive among them. But here, one guy is in charge. He can tax the whole world at this time. And it says here in verse uh, 4, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth, into, get, into Judea, unto the sea of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So this next thing is going to show you, kind of give you an idea of the traveling. It's about 90 miles. It takes about five days. It probably took maybe a little longer than that. You know, I'd never know when she's uh, carrying child. It could be taking a little bit longer than that. But the fathom she was taking this trip on didn't have, you know, a luxury wagon and, and carts and all that stuff to make this kind of a trip, to think about that. Where it's only, now I don't want to ask any of y'all, but 90 miles, how far, how long would it take you to make 90 miles? <laughs> On what? <laughs> On traffic of where you're at. <laughs> but we can make it within an hour, two hours at the most, depending on where you're at and what locality of traffic you're dealing with, of course. We think in those terms. But think what they had to do. She had to, they both had to travel this terrain for those many days to get there, to meet this requirement there. Just kind of give you a perspective about that. So down there, verse 6, it says, And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be, she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there was in the country, same country shepherds abiding in the field. There are shepherds there to show up. And there was the same country, uh, country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch of their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, uh, about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto him, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away, from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. I'm going to stop right there. Who are these shepherds? What, what, what are shepherds in society in that time? Right. 
And so, you know, and you hate to get into category. You know, we all have this in society. You know, those who are this level and this level, wherever you're at in society. But they were at this low level of society because they were taking care of sheep. That's what their lowly job was. And who did the shepherd come to? He told. He came to these people who are common people of a lower status in life. Come to tell them the gospel, the good news to them. Well, I meant to show you the angels that were shouting. There they are. Of course, they go see her. So let's go there. In verse, uh, and they made haste, verse 16, and they made haste and, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Get through my notes here. I got done faster than I thought. My mistake. I'm trying to time these things. I'm getting to the conclusion here. But we get to the conclusion. I want you to think about when I get there, before I even get there. So what? <clears throat> Mary and Joseph were told this about the, from the Lord and, and from the angel as well, what's going to happen, and it took place. And they were what? They were very accepting of this. Were they not? This is God's plan. This is what God wants done. This is God's plan, how it's going to be. And these angels that were told this, these lowly people out in the taking care of their sheep, they do what? What could they have done? Here's these angels show up, scare the daylights out of you probably in the middle of the night. You know, and that's why he said, fear not. But it would be kind of scary. But they accepted of that. And they said, let us go and see. What did he say? Let us go and see this thing. And it came to pass, the angels were gone away. Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. They were willing to go. Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's go see what happened. Let's see what, this, what the angel has told us here. So here's my conclusion, I'm trying to put this together for you. Jesus was born of a virgin, which we know that. That's, our, that's what we believe. We know that's, that's what the scriptures say. And that's what we believe, of course. It's the greatest event that ever took place in history, the virgin birth. Isn't it? Am I asking too many questions? Am I, just, uh, am I off base or something? I just feel like I'm uh, asking questions. And oh, Okay, yeah, John, you're talking. We've heard the story 100,000 times. Where you, we just did it Christmas. We're done with Christmas. We're done. Let's move on. But it was the greatest event that took place. The fullness of time took place that God said, this is what's going to happen in time, framed around time. Jesus was coming into the world, and he did so, to take on the flesh, God incarnate, God among us. When we see Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, when it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, God with us. You know, how amazing that is, that moment in time that took place. God moved the stage to take place. He moved the world stage, all that to take place. Have you ever thought about if Jesus came, if, he had, if, if the birth didn't take place until today? I know it doesn't make sense, but we, we, we kind of think, well, we've got all this technology, and people could, could, would be uh, alerted of what, hey, there's this, this, this thing took place. We just found out this place, thing took place in, in, in Bethlehem, and this guy who's supposed to be the savior of the world just, took, just got born. You know what I'm saying? Our mindset is not, we think in all this technology, we could get it out to the world. But it doesn't work that way, does it? God had a certain time when he wanted the birth of Christ to come into the world. And what happened when the, after the birth of Christ? After the gospel was spread, after his death, burial, and resurrection, what happened? The world was still set. The stage was still set when Paul went out to preach the gospel. When the apostles went out, the world was set at the time. We've talked about that before. Because the world was set for how? It was set by the Romans with their peace and all that, the Roman peace, if you want to call it that. But the language they were able to communicate, the traveling of the roads, they were able to spread the gospel 
which what's to us seems like meager ways of getting it out in a way, but they preached the gospel and got the gospel out and reached the world. But all that, the world, God has set the world this point in time, the fullness of time when Jesus came into the world at that time. I may not be clear how I'm trying to explain that, but the next bullet here. Mary and Joseph were obedient to God's word, command, though they lived in difficult times. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with, his, with Mary, his spouse, wife, being great with child. I bring it up like this, that were they not obedient? The rule was everybody needs to go back and be taxed at your place or your residence. And Joseph, you know, where it says here, he was unto the, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So he went back to Bethlehem. You know, we probably could think in, our, in some of our terms, honey, he could say, Mary, uh, we, we may not make this trip. You know, it's a little bit too much for you. You're about ready to have a baby any day. We might need to stay here. That's not what happened. They loaded up and they made the trip. And it wasn't an easy trip. It wasn't like, like we think in terms, okay, get in the vehicle. We'll be down there in 90 minutes. Two hours, we'll be down there and be over with. It took five days at least to make this trip. And they knew that. But they were obedient to everything and doing all that they did. Jesus' birth was in a meager surroundings, was it not? Where was he born at? He was born in a manger. And he was laid, you know, a manger, uh, we have a tendency to think, what I saw was a, is a, uh, like a stone thing, with their, is a manger that they would use. Not so much wood we think of at times. But whatever it was. But he's not born where? He's not born in a house. He's not born in a palace. And he's the king of kings, the lord of lords. He's not born in a great place. He's born in a lowly stable you know, not even in the inn because they didn't have room for him in the inn to be there. But in a stable out back, yeah, the animals are back there. You can go back there and find your place and y'all can stay back there. In a stable, in a manger, in swaddling clothes. And she shall brought forth her son, firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the meager surroundings they lived in. That he came into the world. The next two bullets I have here. The good news was given to shepherds, people of a lowly occupation and a status in society, not to the religious, wealthy, or the ruling classes. It wasn't given to them, was it? It wasn't. And we know here, of course, it said in Luke chapter 2, verse 10 through 11. The next bullet is the shepherds were faithful to share the good news with others. Were they not? And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. I wonder what it was like to have been there at that time and, and when Jesus was born. These shepherds, can you, can you imagine somebody out, you're out there, where, you don't know where they talked to, maybe went into town, you know, they got, hey, we just saw Jesus. And they're in town, hey, we just saw the king of kings. We just heard, the angels just told us this, we just saw him. We just saw the Savior. Can you imagine those shepherds going around telling that? They didn't sit back and say, well, you know, they might think we're crazy. You know, if we, I, it, might, it might not work. You know, they may not, it might offend somebody if I say it, you know. Don't we have a tendency to think in those terms? And we're trying to share the gospel with other people. Well, it might, you know, it may not come across right. They were telling what they knew had taken place and were sharing the gospel. I didn't show you, but there he is. So, do you know him? What about your relationship to Jesus Christ? Do you know him? And do you share the gospel with other people? Those of us who know Christ should be sharing the gospel with other people. Is that right or wrong? We know it. We hear it. We should be doing it. Should we not share the gospel with other people? How many times do we have the opportunity to do so? We kind of make an excuse or we kind of overlook it. I don't know about you. I missed one the other day. I overlooked it. I had the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody and overlooked it until later. Until I realized, oh, I messed up. We all do it. I'm not, I'm not excusing that, but we all do it at times. We need to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit when to share the, to share the gospel with other people. Anybody have any comments, any questions? Yes, Teresa.
Right. Anybody else? Good point. I think sometimes we get so familiarized with the Christmas story, we seem to lose the awe of the Christmas story. Of what it was and what took place and how the Lord just brought all this together for us at this point in time. Anybody else? Anything else? All right, I got two things to share with you, a couple of things, I think. Uh, next week, just so you know, next week, if you happen to be here, we're going to talk about Simeon and Anna, about them, when he's presented in the temple, when Jesus is brought to the temple, and what took place there, about their times. And these last two things is what I showed you last week, in case you're interested. Uh, my recommendations, I got them up here for study. I, it's not a commercial. It, well, I guess it is commercial. Sword Searcher, if you never use the Bible program, I like this program. I got it. Uh, Bob Seifel told me about it, and I got it, and I like it. Very useful program to be of help to you. Um, and I have a handout on that. I have another handout up here of this other place called Way of Life Literature. They have a lot of books. They have some free e-books if you like e-books. He's got those available too. And I got a listing of those up here. Yeah, I do have a listing of that too as well. All right. I try to share information. I try to share things with people so we know what good resources might be out there for you. Any comments, any questions? I know you're going to be shocked, but we're going to be done before the bell rings here. I, didn't, I knew I'd realize I zipped through it so fast. All right, let's go, Lord, and pray, and we'll be dismissed. And those things are up here. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord, thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for your word. Um, just thank you for your word. It's more important than my words or anybody else's words, but thank you for your words and, and, and allowing us to have your words with us, Lord. And, and help us, Lord, how to study thy word, and how to share it with other people, and to be a witness, a testimony to people we meet and deal with. Lord, at this time of year, so much uh, meeting with families and other people we deal with, uh, to take the opportunity to share the gospel with them, and not to fail to share the gospel. Lord, help our pastor this morning, the strength and the grace and the wisdom he needs always. Take care of him, protect him, and help him, Lord, as he preaches this morning. Help in the children's ministries that are going on this morning as well. Uh, help them as they're uh, trying to work the children's, I, all that's going on. Help these families, these requests, Lord, that were made known for our dealing with uh, Teresa's sis, uh, family members dealing with this surgery in, in February. And others, Lord, are dealing with uh, health issues, Lord, as well. I ask for Amy Plummer, Lord, you'd help her to recover from COVID, Lord, if you would, please. And others who are dealing with COVID, Lord, to help them recover. Just thank you. In Jesus' name we ask you. Thank you, Lord. Amen.